So what are the factors that affect enzyme activity? In a previous lesson, I showed you an enzyme and I talked about the fact that they're biological catalysts that speed up chemical reactions in our cells. So an enzyme, for example, with its active site could convert this substrate into these two products or vice versa. These could be the substrates that get converted into this product, right? The critical thing that we learned in that lesson was that shapes and complementary shapes are critical to the way that enzyme functions. And there are three factors that we're gonna talk about in this lesson that affect enzyme activity, and they all affect enzyme activity due to shapes and either changing of those shapes or blocking of the connection between those complementary shapes. Here are the three factors that we're gonna focus on. Enzymes are sensitive to changes in temperature, changes in pH, and the presence of these things called chemical inhibitors. All right, let's look at the first one. The first one is temperature. Now, if we take our enzyme here, and I wanna to talk to you first about colder temperatures, right? We know that an enzyme functions best at a specific temperature. We call that specific temperature its optimum temperature. And depending on the different enzyme, will depend on what that optimum temperature is. Now, when an enzyme's at its optimum, it's carrying out the reaction over and over and over again at its fastest possible rate. Think about what happens to chemical molecules when they get cooled down, okay? So this is happening at its fastest possible rate. We start to slow this down because it's getting cooler and cooler and cooler. And as particles get colder, they're slowing further and further down until we've reached a point where we've slowed these particles down so much that they're not colliding with each other. The only way this reaction can take place is for the substrate to collide with the active site of this enzyme. If that temperature's gotten too cold, that reaction's not gonna be taking place, and that is how cold temperatures can affect enzyme activity. Then we can go the other direction hot temperatures, when we get warmer and warmer and warmer. Now, yes, when we warm things up, they move faster and faster. So the reaction rate's gonna increase and get better and better. But once it gets to the optimum, that's as good as it's gonna get. If you get hotter than the optimum, what that actually does is it denatures our enzyme. That's a new term for you. Here's a denatured enzyme. Here's the original enzyme. We've got the original enzyme here. We've got the denatured enzyme here. Here's the substrate. Right, the substrate fits perfectly into the active site of the regular enzyme. Once we've heated the enzyme to a higher temperature and it's become denatured, have a look at the active site. No longer is the substrate going to fit into that active site. We have actually changed the shape of our enzyme. It's no longer complementary to our substrate. Therefore, it is no longer going to function. That's what high temperatures do to enzymes. All right, so cool temperatures slow enzyme activity down. High temperatures slow enzyme activity down, but they slow it down permanently because they denature the enzyme. Here's a graph showing you the reaction rate versus the temperature for enzyme activity. The green dotted line shows you the optimum because that's where we've got our highest reaction rate is at a certain temperature. Now, as I explained, when we go below that optimum temperature, the reaction rate slowly drops off, drops off, drops off, drops off. It will eventually reach 
a zero rate of reaction where those molecules have slowed down so much that they're just not coming in contact with each other at all. When we heat above the optimum temperature, you can see here a much more rapid decline because what's happening there is the enzymes are quickly denaturing. Once they've denatured and changed shape, we can't go back. Once you've melted and rearranged the structure of that protein that makes up the enzyme, there's no going back. The reaction rate will quickly drop off, the enzymes are denatured, and that's what happens there with temperature. So there you have the first factor of temperature and how it affects enzyme activity. All right, the next factor is pH level. pH level is how acidic or basic a solution is. Different enzymes function best at different pH levels. That level where they function best is called the optimum. Right, now let me give you an example. An enzyme in my stomach is going to function best at an acidic pH, you know, around a pH of about 3. An enzyme in another place in my body would function best at a more neutral pH. Say, an enzyme in my blood, for example, okay, is going to function better at a higher pH than 3 because it's not as acidic as the environment of my stomach. What happens with enzymes when they move away from their optimum pH level is the same as what happens with enzymes when they are heated to higher temperatures. They denature. So we're going to end up with the same situation. When the pH moves away from the optimum, just move the graph over there for the time being, as we move the pH away from the optimum, and we get too acidic or too basic, we're going to change the shape of our enzyme, which means it has been denatured. And of course, once the enzyme is denatured, it is no longer complementary to its substrate and it will no longer function. Once enzymes denature, there's no going back, which is why when we look at our graph, we see a steep drop off as we move away from the optimum to lower pHs, steep drop off. As we move away from the optimum to higher pHs, steep drop off. And there you have it, that's what happens when pH influences enzyme activity. All right, the last factor that I talked about is called chemical inhibitors. Here we have the two examples of chemical inhibitors because there are two types. Chemical inhibitors are chemical molecules, similar to a substrate molecule. They have a chemical shape and structure, and there are two types. There's competitive inhibitors, I've got an example here, and non-competitive inhibitors, the example is here. I'm going to bring back the enzyme. Right, and I want you to look at the shape of these two, start to think about maybe formulating something in your mind as to what these terms might mean. Okay, competitive inhibitors, as you can see from this molecule, it has a fairly similar structure to our substrate molecule. That's really important. Because what do we know is important? complementary shapes. That's what facilitates the binding and the speeding up of the reaction for that substrate. Now, the competitive inhibitor, it's not the same shape as the substrate, but it is a similar shape, similar enough to allow it to bind to that active site. As you can see there, not a perfect fit at all, but enough of a complementary shape to allow binding to the active side of that enzyme. The thing is, once that competitive inhibitor binds with that enzyme, the enzyme doesn't recognize it as the substrate. The enzyme can't facilitate the breakdown of that substrate because it is a different molecule. And the inhibitor actually remains bound to that enzyme and cannot be removed. And you can imagine what that would be like. If my hands were enzymes, Okay, and the process that they sped up was removing the lid from a texture, 
But if you super glued a bowling ball to my hands, I'm not going to be taking the lid off of any textures anytime soon. Right? The bowling ball is your chemical inhibitor, and that's exactly what's going on here. Your competitive inhibitor has blocked the enzyme, it won't be able to speed up the reaction, and that's, that's how it affects enzyme activity. Okay, so that's your competitive inhibitor. You've now got your non-competitive inhibitor. Right, the name indicates that no, it's not going to compete for the active site. Now for simplicity so far, I've shown you this enzyme and I've kept it simple. Okay, don't freak out, but I'm going to introduce something that you haven't seen before. Enzymes are not as simple as my diagram might indicate. This is an enzyme and what I'm showing you is that enzymes actually also have an alternative binding site. Not the active site, and it's elsewhere on the enzyme. So it's not our active site here, it's somewhere else on the enzyme, and it's a different shape altogether. Now what can happen sometimes with enzymes is our non-competitive inhibitor it has no interest in the active site, but it does have a complementary shape to our alternative site. And when it binds with the alternative site, it causes the enzyme to change shape, as you can see here. And now that this enzyme has changed shape, it's warped the shape of the active site, that's no longer going to fit with our substrate, so therefore, we prevented the activity of the enzyme without competing for the active site. Hence the name non-competitive. This molecule here is not competing with the substrate for the active site. The active site is still vacant. It's just had its shape altered so it can no longer bind with our substrate. So that's how the process of non-competitive inhibition works. Binding at an alternative site on the enzyme and preventing the binding of the substrate with the active site. Okay, I hope this has helped everyone. I'm just going to summarise for you and recap the main points. The main points are that there are three factors that influence enzyme activity. And those three factors are changes in temperature, changes in pH level, and the presence of chemical inhibitors. I really hope this has helped, and I'll see you next time.